One of the things we want to be able to do is to understand what makes stuff move. So we might have a vehicle moving like this, and we want to understand what makes it go. But before we can do that, we do need some kind of language to describe the motion that we see. Okay, so not even understanding what's pushing it or what's driving it, but just to describe the motion that we're observing. So that might be a graph of the object's position over time, or it might be some equations that um, tell you what, what's, what's going on. So there are some concepts that sort of are part of this vocabulary of describing motion, such as position, velocity, and acceleration. And they're all part of the first area of physics we're going to study in this course, which is called kinematics. Okay, so in this lesson, we're going to look at the first building blocks of kinematics. So we're going to focus in motion in one dimension, just to keep it simple, and to look at, we'll look at displacement and distance. So one dimension just means our car is limited to moving in a straight line. There's none of the other stuff that we normally can have. Okay, so I'm Richard Brown, Kia ora koutou. Uh, I'm one of your lecturers for biophysical principles. Okay, so to be able to make some mathematical statement about movement, we first need to be able to specify where our object is, such as this Lego car. So in our natural world, we've got three dimensions, right? Uh, so but there's, if we could turn, in terms of our car's motion, we've got sort of forward and backwards motion. Um, we could do side to side, and we could also do up and down. Okay, there are three ones. So we're going to limit ourselves to motion just along a single straight line uh, for the time being. Okay, so what we do is we take our straight line, we lay it out in some reference position, uh, and then we mark a special spot on it that we call zero. We can put it wherever we like, but once it's there, it's there. And then we choose one direction to be positive, and one direction to be negative, and they go out in opposite directions. So how exactly we do that is up to us. Um, if our line was north-south, for example, we could choose north to be positive and south to be negative, or we could do it the other way around. It doesn't really matter. The only thing is, once you've chosen, you need to be consistent or bad things might happen. Okay, so when we draw our line on paper, though, generally we'll, we'll do it left to right, and left will be negative and right will be positive. That's just what we always do. If we tried to do it the other way around, it wouldn't be wrong, but it would probably make our heads hurt. So we can specify position by just giving a single number corresponding to the matching point on the line. So for example, we could call this position x as the standard name for it, and I could put my car at position 3 or at position negative 2, and that's completely unambiguous. Okay, so that's position. It specifies where we are on our number line. So our next closely related concept is that of displacement. So just the word itself, displacement, suggests that something has been moved or displaced from its starting position. So to have a displacement, we need to know a starting position, and we usually write our displacement as delta x is xf minus xi, where the subscripts f and i are for final and initial, respectively. So the triangle, that's just a capital Greek letter delta, and usually it indicates the change in something. So when you see a delta, generally speaking, it indicates something is changing, or you're going to calculate a difference of something. Displacements can be negative or positive, and it indicates how far from the starting position you are. Positive meaning to the right, and negative meaning to the left. So for example, if I start at an initial position xi of 2 meters, and undergo a displacement of negative 3 meters, that just means I shift left by 3 meters, or shift to the negative direction by 3 meters, which should put me at my final position xf of negative 1. You can see you could also get this from the formula as well. Um, just if we want to plug it in, we get delta x is xf minus xi. I'm going to rearrange that for xf, because that's what we want at the end, which gives me xi plus delta x. I'm going to put my numbers in, so it's going to be 2 meters plus negative 3 meters, which gives me negative 1 meters overall. Now just a little trick or a little trap that you might fall into. Displacement and position in books and everywhere, and probably in this course too, they're used almost interchangeably because they're essentially the same thing. And they're exactly the same thing if the starting position is zero. So may maybe it helps to think of position as a displacement from zero if you just want to have one concept. Okay, but the thing that is actually fundamentally different is distance. So 
let's just take a, an example motion. I'm going to start at two meters. I'm going to move to six meters, and then I'm going to move back again. So the questions I might ask myself are, what was my displacement? Well, my starting position was two, my ending position is two, and so my displacement, delta x, is two minus two, is zero meters. I haven't actually, I've ended up exactly where I started, so my overall displacement is zero. Now, something we can do with displacements is we can split them up into pieces. So I can split my motion into two pieces, which have two different displacements each. The first one is going to be a displacement of plus four meters, i.e. four meters to the right. And my second displacement will be a displacement of negative four meters, okay, moving back to the left. When I've split it up like this, I can add the individual displacements together to get my overall one. And so that will give me a displacement overall of zero. But when I'm talking about distance, which is slightly different, both of these displacements travel a distance of four meters. Okay, there's no negative signs for distance. Distance is always positive. So my total distance that I've moved is going to be eight meters, four meters each way. So think of distance as just measuring how far you've gone, no matter what direction I'm pointing in. So like the odometer on a car, which measures how far you've gone, doesn't know which way around the road, down the road you're going, or maybe you you track runs on your phone or your watch. Um, those things never start going back down again, right? They just keep they just add up your cumulative distance, so it's never going to run backwards. So there are some maths words for quantities that behave like this. Displacement is what's called a vector quantity. It has a magnitude, which is a positive number indicating how big it is, and it also has a direction. Now for us in one dimension, direction is just going to be one or sorry, positive or negative, corresponding to which way, which part of the line we're on. Um, and it also, and then the magnitude, that is our distance, and that's a scalar quantity, okay? It's just a number. So in two dimensions and upwards, um, specifying direction is a bit more involved than just plus and minus, because you've got sort of all sorts of different ways you can point, but we'll just sort of save that discussion for a bit later on. Right, so one way of describing displacements a motion over time is to use a displacement time graph. So we're going to illustrate this here using a cool little simulation called the moving man. Uh, there are a whole lot of these physics called FET simulations uh, that are really helpful for exploring physical concepts. This one lets us visualize motion by dragging a little man around. So I'm going to open it up. If you wanted to follow along you can do the same thing. Switch across to the charts tab so I can see my graphs. I only really care about the position graph at this point. Okay, so my horizontal axis, you see that's time, and my vertical axis, that is my position. So I'm just gonna zoom my time back out again. So you can see that if I start to move my man around, his position is recorded on this graph, at the vertical point. So you can see I've moved into four meters, and my graph is steady here at four meters because it's not actually moving. But then if I move into negative, Eight, you can see it tracks its way down to negative eight and then just keeps on going. Because time is just going steadily, the, this graph is going to keep moving across uh, constantly. Okay, so um, if I hold the guy still like I just did, you get that flat line. If I'm moving to the right, the graph seemed to go upwards. Let's just try that again, shall we? And if I'm moving to the left, the graph seemed to go downwards again. Okay, so now you might want to open this up yourself and try a couple of little sort of thought experiments or questions to try out before we jump back in again. So open the simulation up. Don't forget to switch across to the charts tab and see if you can answer the following couple of questions. Try and guess the answers before you even run the thing. So first off, what is the difference between moving the man slowly to the right and moving the man quickly to the right? What, is, what visually does that look like on our graph? And what happens if I do the same thing, but instead of going to the right, I go to the left? Okay, so have a go at that. All right, so hopefully you've had a go. Um, and what we'll see, let's just do that right experiment first. So I'm going to move slowly to start with. Then I'm going to move quickly. And he smacks into the wall. So what happens when he's moving slowly, I get a kind of shallow upwards motion to my graph. And when he's moving quickly, it's suddenly a whole lot steeper. Do it again just to test. 
Um, so I'll put them over here. Oop. Stop. Clear. So I go, let's go quickly first this time and then slowly. Yeah, so the quick motion corresponded to a steep increase in our curve and the slow one to a more gentle one. And the same thing happens when I move left. So if I move slowly to the left, it's kind of a shallow line downwards. And if I move quickly, it's a whole lot steeper. Okay, cool. Now, now is as good a time as any to start talking about units briefly. So every number that we, every physical quantity that we talk about in this course only really makes sense if it has units. So if I tell you I'm at position five at time 10, that in itself doesn't really mean anything. Is it five kilometers at 10 hours or is it five millimeters at 10 seconds? Okay, so we always need to make sure things have units. And there are a special set of units called the SI, which is System, I'm not gonna even try pronouncing it in a French accent, System International units that always work nicely together in the equations that we're going to use. So in this system, distance is always in meters, time is always in seconds, mass, which we'll get to a bit later, is always in kilograms, and we'll introduce more and more of these as we go. So we'll cover conversions between units later, but it's generally a good idea to convert all quantities you're working with to SI units before you put them in your equations. Now one very, very common conversion that you might end up having to do is converting from kilometers per hour to meters per second and back again. So you can always do this by multiplying or dividing by 3.6. So we've got one meter per second is 3.6 kilometers per hour, and one kilometer per hour is one over 3.6 meters per second. So for example, if I want to know 100 kilometers per hour in meters per second, that will be 100 over 3.6, which is about 27.8 meters per second. Now, later on in the course, we'll teach you how to derive these unit conversions, but for now, that's one that you use so often that it's kind of worth just remembering the factor. Okay, our next kinematic quantity up is velocity. So in day-to-day -day language, velocity and speed tend to mean the same thing. So you can have a high-speed blender or a high-velocity fan, but in physics, they have more precise meanings. So just like displacement is a vector and distance is a scalar, we also have that velocity is a vector and speed is a scalar. So this means velocity has both a magnitude, which is actually the speed, and also a direction, which again for us will be positive or negative, depending on whether it's to the right or to the left. Think of speed as like the speedo in your car. Doesn't matter which direction you're driving down the road, it will always read a positive speed. Velocity is a bit trickier to pin down. So let's say I've got a motion where I travel to the right 10 meters in five seconds. So you might think that my velocity is therefore two meters per second, because that's kind of what I did on average. I traveled two meters every second to get my 10. But what I don't know is whether I traveled 10 meters in one second and then just stopped for four seconds, or if I moved nice and steadily. So what I've calculated is actually just my average velocity. So we've got an equation for this. The average velocity V av, or average, is delta x over delta t, so the change in position over the change in time, which will be xf minus xi, my displacement, divided by tf minus ti. Okay, so it has units of meters per second, and you can sometimes write this as m times s to the negative one, it means the same thing. And it is the average velocity over the time interval between ti and tf. So a negative velocity corresponds to moving left, and a positive velocity corresponds to moving right. Notice how the change in time, delta t, is calculated exactly the same way as the change in position, i.e. the displacement, as final minus initial. So for example, let's say we have the following information. Our initial position is two meters, our final position is negative three meters, and then we go between time of zero seconds and two seconds. So that means, just looking at it, um, we moved left by five meters to get from two to negative three, and it took us two seconds, so we should get negative 2.5 for our average velocity. So let's just check that our formula will give us that answer. So my average velocity is going to be xf minus xi over tf minus ti, so it'll be negative 3 minus 2 divided by 2 minus 0 meters per second, which is indeed negative 2.5 meters per second. So we could indicate these data points on a distance versus time graph, 
And you can see that what we've calculated is the ratio of the two sides of this sort of triangle that we can put on here. So it's the height, or sometimes called the rise of the triangle, divided by the distance across, which is the run. And because the it goes downwards, it doesn't rise at all, so it's going to be negative. The rise is negative. Okay, well let's just say I've got a bit more information now, and I actually achieved this motion by first moving left 4 meters in one second, and then moving that final meter left in another second second. <laughs> I can indicate this by adding an additional point to my distance time graph. Okay, so it's no longer a straight line. So what we can do is we could calculate two average velocities for those finer intervals. Okay, my average velocity overall is still going to be negative 2.5, but I could do it for those two intervals and it'll be different for, the, uh, for, the, for them. So the first one, my average velocity in the first time interval is going to be negative 4 over 1, or negative 4 meters per second. And in the second interval, that one I only travel 1 meter to the left, so it's negative 1 over 1 second is going to be negative 1 meters per second. And if we knew more data points, we could kind of take these intervals finer and finer and get these different average velocities for each one of those intervals at every point in time, if you squint your eyes a bit. So if we did that and we kind of just took these intervals smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller then we're kind of converging to an estimate of the velocity at every single point along our graph. So that velocity, which is defined for every point in time, is called the instantaneous velocity. Okay, we're going to talk more about that in the next video. But our average velocity is still negative 2.5 meters per second when you consider the whole interval as a single whole. Okay, so next time we're going to do more of that and we'll talk about some ways of actually calculating these instantaneous velocities and how velocity time graphs relate to distance time graphs next time. Okay, so a couple of just a little recap before we, before we head off. Um, first point, there are very precise definitions for words in physics that maybe don't exactly mean the same thing as in day-to-day -day life. Um, so we, we realize that things like displacement and velocity, they are vector quantities, so direction is important. Whereas things like distance and speed, they are scalars, and they're actually positive scalars. Other things we learned today, we learned how to draw and interpret a position time graph. We know how to locate our object at different times. So now you're ready to move on to the next workshop where you'll attack some of these problems in context. So make sure you spend some time practicing these, and we'll see you soon. Kakite anō.